Test, one, two, three. Test, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Testing one, two. This is HRS. My check. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two.
The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We want to welcome everyone here uh, to the hearing on China IP theft, cybersecurity, and AI. And please have a seat. Uh, I will now recognize myself for a short opening statement. First of all, for everyone in attendance, especially our witnesses, I want to thank you for your indulgence as we have had uh, a series of missteps and delays in what I believe is one of the most important uh, hearings that this subcommittee will have this year. Our panel of experts understand all too well the critical threat faced by the communist Chinese uh, government. I always say the communist Chinese government so as to differentiate it from the government in Taiwan, which at one time was known for disregarding patents, trademarks, and the like, but has done an out about face over the last several decades and now is very much part of a community that is, that is responsible in its actions toward intellectual property. With the advent and growth of artificial and uh, regenerative artificial intelligence, one of the key activities that we see the Chinese government doing is in fact predictive use of AI in order to both steal real intellectual property and also to box off and in fact deny real inventors their intellectual property. The cyber warfare conducted by the Chinese uh, government is not new. In fact, the Chinese military itself has divisions that are, exist both to steal military secrets and uh, commercial activities. In the coming years, AI will pose uh, a transformative uh, relationship to all industries, but it also will particularly affect cybersecurity. A supercomputer that can break any code, a supercomputer that can anticipate changes and the like can in fact completely neuter existing cybersecurity systems. As a result, AI will be fighting against AI in cybersecurity. We will hear shortly, <clears throat> we will hear shortly if, Ch if China wins the cyber AI rounds, uh, arms race, their ability to steal technology and harm not just our country, but the free world will in fact be permanent. To be sure, American AI development must be done carefully, ethically, and with respect for the values that make us different than the Chinese adversaries. But today's hearing should make clear to everyone how important the 21st century arms race is, not only to Republicans and Democrats, but to all Americans, and particularly to those who want to be the inventors and the innovators of the future. I hope all my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will join with me in seeing the importance of urging the administration, and it, my, my, uh, my opening statement says to shift the priorities, and I will modify by that by saying to enhance and expand their priorities to meet the challenge. All of us must come together as AI users, creators, technology companies, and yes, the government to meet this challenge. No less than the American way and the free world advancements we've had since World War II are at stake. I want to thank all my witnesses for being here today. And with that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Johnson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing, and thank you to our bipartisan slate of witnesses for being willing to share your perspectives with the committee today, and, um, and thank you for your forbearance in our having to postpone this hearing in the past. Uh, Americans cannot pick up a newspaper without a near daily reminder that artificial intelligence, or AI, is transforming the world as we know it. With a few keystrokes, a lay person can generate an image indistinguishable from a photograph. They can make a business plan based on AI-driven supply chain predictive analysis, 
or write code for a new application. Langston Hughes may have died over 50 years ago, but sitting here today, I can ask Chat GPT to write an original poem in his style. AI innovations have sparked necessary debate about intellectual property protections for both the owners of the massive quantities of data used to train AI models and the authors of final products of AI-assisted works. But the disruptions to society don't end there. Looming behind labor disputes lie questions about the future of work when AI is used by the powers that be to replace writers, technicians, and auto workers. I'm committed to working with my colleagues across the aisle to protect creators, inventors, and intellectual property rights overall while encouraging innovation and invention. But we are here today to talk about just one of the many ripple effects of AI innovation, how AI is being used and can be used in the future to augment China's strategy towards the United States. As a global leader in AI innovation, the People's Republic of China, or PRC, is in a unique place to deploy AI before many other nations. But if the PRC chooses to use AI to increase its authoritarian hold over its own people, to advance its cyber espionage strategy, or to interfere in its neighbor's elections, such actions will undermine competition and innovation, not just in China, but around the world. Since the PRC entered the World Trade Organization 20 years ago, it has endeavored to gain American data, intellectual property, and our nation's secrets. Cyber intrusions from the Chinese government or affiliated groups have successfully infiltrated the United States Department of Justice, our military bases, and businesses across the country. The adoption of AI only increases China's ability to continue these tactics. So far, China has tested swarms of AI-powered drones, used AI-generated propaganda to target U.S. politics, and stolen AI technology from U.S. companies. Experts disagree as to how far China has advanced in AI development. Indeed, many argue that AI innovations are happening so quickly that it is difficult to know what the technology can and cannot do at any given time. But there is a consensus that the United States, with its broad, away of, a broad array of businesses, strong intellectual property protections, and widespread investment in scientific research, is, a, is ahead of most other nations. Many Americans believe that it is incumbent on the United States to lead. I'm one of them. But leading in development alone is not sufficient. The European Union this summer took steps to regulate artificial intelligence by passing draft legislation that the EU is calling, quote, the world's first comprehensive AI law, end quote. Even China has issued interim guidelines to regulate the use of generative AI in theory, if not in practice. Of the leading nations on AI, the United States stands out for its absence of basic rules of the road. American technology companies and industry leaders have called on the U.S. government to regulate AI and curtail the privacy and security risks posed by the technology. I'm eager to hear from our witnesses whether Congress can properly regulate AI while allowing the innovation to flourish. But we should not stop there. To succeed, we need international collaboration and cooperation in the form of a multinational agreement on privacy and security. It is only when the leading nations on AI, including China, agree to AI intellectual property, privacy, and security principles that we can take full advantage of the benefits AI promises. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. Like any new technology, 
AI can be used for good purposes or for bad purposes. And it has startling political potential. For example, using AI, one could generate political ads, convincing political ads, showing Jim Jordan endorsing Joe Biden or me endorsing Donald Trump. During our first hearing of this series, I noted that the government of the People's Republic of China, or PRC, has both manipulated the free market system and used outright illegal means to acquire other nations' intellectual property. In a field that largely relies on players to act in good faith, acquisition of new technologies through theft, cyber espionage, and other forms of subterfuge is part of China's broader national security and economic strategy. In no other field of innovation is this truer than in that of artificial intelligence. The raw material of AI is data. This is why entities backed by the PRC are taking steps to acquire massive quantities of data from the United States and its allies, and they are using all means at their disposal to do so. Within the past decade, we have seen well-publicized data thefts originating in China, such as the 2015 data breach at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, the SolarWinds hack back in 2020, and the Microsoft Exchange hack in 2021. But the thefts that make headlines are just a small fraction of the total. According to a 2022 report by CrowdStrike, which is represented here today, China was behind 67% of cyber attacks between mid-2020 and mid-2021. Because the Chinese government exercises authoritarian control of the country's economy, many companies in the PRC are state-affiliated, maintain close ties to military and state security services, and are, are susceptible to state coercion, or all three. This blurs the lines between public and private collection of Americans' data. Chinese-affiliated actors are buying data from commercial data brokers. They are also collecting data on U.S. persons through Chinese-owned software applications such as TikTok and medical diagnostic platforms like the DNA sequencing company BGI. Even as the Chinese government attempts to gain access to as much data as possible from the United States and its allies, Chinese officials have taken legal and regulatory steps to limit access to data that originates in China. and They have implemented controls that prevent the export and use of such data outside the PRC. Their goal is to gain an unfair advantage over other nations, first by obtaining greater quantities of information, and then by using that information to create new AI capabilities. The widespread acquisition and deployment of AI by China has implications for the world at large. Using the power of AI, a hacker can scour a network for so-called zero-day vulnerabilities in seconds. An espionage agent tasked with spreading disinformation can create a video that appears to show a domestic political dissident or a foreign political leader confessing to a crime or endorsing the wrong candidate, as I said before. A police state can track persecuted groups and quell dissent, as the Chinese government has already done with members of its Uyghur minority. Until now, the PRC's influence campaigns have mostly targeted its own people, focusing on sources of internal friction, such as the status of Taiwan, and COVID-19. For example, the DNI found that China did not attempt to influence the 2020 presidential elections. But many experts agree that posture is swiftly changing, which means that the threat posed by China's development of AI is growing. Recently, the New York Times reported that in an attempt to sow discord within the United States, China used AI-generated images to spread conspiracy theories about the Maui wildfires that caused the deaths of nearly 100 Americans. Whether these particular deep fakes were successful remains to be seen, but the danger is unmistakable. Addressing that danger begins with understanding the full nature of China's artificial intelligence strategy and the steps Congress can take to help address the threats posed by it. For that reason, this series of hearings is absolutely crucial. At the same time, I would also like to add that I appreciate the tactful manner with which these hearings have been conducted. Even as we protect our national security and intellectual property, we continue to seek common ground with China on issues that affect both our countries, such as fighting climate change. 
even when we express deep concern over actions taken by the authoritarian Chinese government, we recognize that those actions do not represent the will of the Chinese people. The United States, meanwhile, is home to an estimated 17.8 million Asian Americans, including many residents of the Upper West and Upper East Sides of Manhattan. Like so many lawmakers, I have heard from Asian American constituents who are terrified by the rise in anti-Asian anti hate and anti-Asian violence that we have seen as friction grows between the PRC and the United States. I am glad that our hearings have called attention to the very real national security and economic challenges America faces <coughs> from the policies of the Chinese government without demonizing the more than one billion people who live in China or the millions of Asian Americans who make our communities and country stronger every day. I am hopeful and confident that our important work will continue, not just in this hearing, but in the weeks and months to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. <coughs> Without objection, all, all other opening statements will be included in the record. It is now my honor to introduce our distinguished panel of witnesses. Dr. William Hannes is the lead analyst at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Prior to joining C CSET, or CSET, he was a member of the, the senior, Sir, Inte senior Intelligence Service at the Central Intelligence Agency, where he served as an expert on advanced technical projects and was the three-time recipient of the McCone Award for Technological Innovation. Dr. Hannes has also served as Assistant Professor of, uh, of Chinese at Georgetown, while concurrently serving with the CIA's open source enterprise. We're also joined by Dr. John Brennan. Dr. Brennan is the General Manager, Public Sector at Scale AI, he has 25 years of experience across the public and private sectors and has developed and led programs in cloud computing, data science in support of intelligence collection and analysis, cybersecurity, new product innovation, and supply chain. He has also served our country in the United States Army with the Central Intelligence Agency and the Office of the Director of National uh, Intelligence. We're joined also by Dr. Benjamin Jensen. Dr. Jensen is a senior fellow for future war gaming and strategy in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He is also a professor of strategic studies at the Marine Corps University School of Advanced War Fighting. Dr. Jensen has worked with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, NATO, and the U.S. Army, and a range of other government agencies and foundations to develop war games and scenario-driven exercises. Mr. Robert Sheldon. Mr. Sheldon is the Senior Director of Public Policy and Strategy at CrowdStrike. He is he ha where he leads corporate engagement on a variety of U.S. federal, state, and local government policies, programs, and initiatives. He runs CrowdStrike's election security initiatives, serves as its company's representative to the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative and IT Sector Coordinating Council, and heads the Congressional Affairs Practice. Mr. Sheldon also serves as an adjunct professor lecturer on international cybersecurity policy at the American University School of International Service. We seldom have this much, int no, let me rephrase this, on this side of the dais, we never have this much intellect, and even among our distinguished witnesses, you all stand out. Pursuant to committee rules, I would ask that you please all rise now to take the oath. Raise your right hand. Do you, do you swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please know that, please know that you're, as witnesses, 
all of your uh, written statements and collateral material you wish to give us will be included in the record. So with that, I would ask that you limit your uh, actual oral statements initially at five minutes to allow plenty of time for, for everyone to speak. I will mention, and I apologize, that there has been scheduled a conference uh, for uh, the majority at 11 o'clock. That does not mean we'll necessarily adjourn at that moment, but it does mean that members will be a, a little rushed and we'll try to get as many in as we can before that. So with that, uh, we go to Dr. Hannes first for your five minutes. You're recognized. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, distinguished members of the subcommittee and staff, I'm grateful for the opportunity to join today's hearing on two topics that have fascinated and frankly terrified me over the past decades, namely China's use of foreign, tech, uh, of foreign technology to fuel its science and technology enterprise, and China's drive to become the world's leader in artificial intelligence. I'm a founding member of Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology, where I work with a small team to identify threats posed by Chinese AI. Uh, prior to that, as stated, I was with the CIA, where I managed open source exploitation of Chinese s and materials and built a program to track China's transfer of U.S. technologies. Uh, these efforts culminated in two books on Chinese industrial espionage and China's quest for foreign technology, which became de facto handbooks, and the recent volume, co-authored volume, Chinese Power and Artificial Intelligence, a comprehensive look at Chinese AI. China's technology transfer programs date from 1956 and cover every imaginable practice and venue. The link with AI, besides China's use of its collection apparatus to tap global AI know-how, is the likelihood that China will soon, if it is not already, use AI for cyber exploits to further its transfer agenda. An unholy marriage in which advances in the one promote progress in the other, multiplying existing threats to U.S. and allied security. I'll talk about these three in turn. First, Chinese technology transfer practices. Uh, it's impossible to condense some 700 pages of book narrative, terabytes of unclassified data, a mile-long list of known cases, and two decades of horror stories into this brief space. Uh, my testimony accordingly is limited to an overview of how the Chinese transfer system operates with emphasis on so-called extra-legal or gray area transfers, maneuvers, at which China excels and which are devilishly hard to track. Uh, Chinese artificial intelligence, my team does not share the perception that China's alleged, alleged lag in generative AI, uh, that is large language models, absolves us from concern because A, they're not that far behind. B, China need not be at the cusp to adapt these models wherever it wishes. Uh, C, it can literally beg, borrow, and steal what it needs to be competitive. And finally, and, and I, I think most importantly, China is aggressively pursuing alternative paths to advanced AI uh, aimed at artificial general intelligence and a first mover advantage. Uh, China's use of tech transfer to further its AI program. This is two-sided. Um, while respecting China's homegrown efforts to build advanced AI, which we have come to greatly admire. They do a lot of good indigenous work. China has not shied from acquiring AI technology from abroad. My team has documented Chinese, China's use of each of its acquisition venues to advance its AI program. Legal venues of support provided by US multinationals are on a scale that shocks even this jaundiced observer. A case against China's efforts to relieve the world of proprietary technology is easier to make now than years before, as evidenced by today's hearing. But myths die hard, such as the notion that China can't create uh, in AI or other high-tech disciplines. They can. Uh, that it will always be behind. That's not necessarily true. Or that exposure to democracy will lead to responsible behavior. We all know how that experiment turned out. The United States intelligence community, USIC, of which I was a part, and to that extent responsible, should also be held accountable for its failure to seriously pursue so-called science and technology, s and intelligence. 
Um, that is identifying and monitoring foreign s and threats and for relegating open source intelligence to an enabler of classified collection rather than regarding open source as an entity worth pursuing in its own right. In sum, I'm, I'm arguing that you can't make good policy if you don't have good data. Uh, our efforts to monitor foreign science and technology, inherently an open source um, exercise, are frankly pathetic. They're worse than useless because these, these co cosmetic efforts are seen as evidence of measures in place where there are few or none. China, by contrast, runs a world-class open source S&T intelligence network with a staff by their admission of more than 100,000 professionals. That is light years ahead of us. Accordingly, I recommend establishing an entity within the US government uh, for lack of a better name, a National Science and Technology Analysis Center. Outside the USIC, or if that is impossible, as a standalone unit directly within the, under, under the Directorate of uh, National Intelligence, to collect, analyze, forecast, give timely policy support, and as needed, help mitigate or interdict foreign s and threats. Since China's ability to appropriate technology is part of its s and posture, the center would also track these transfers using unclassified data and tradecraft honed by open source experts. As for the threat to US IP generally, um, we've appended to our, um, our written testimony some 18 proposed legislative and institutional remedies uh, to this that, that address the problem in a, in a nuanced fashion. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Dr. Brennan. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the Subcommittee on the Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is John Brennan, and I joined Scale AI in April to lead our public sector business. This work puts me at the crossroads of AI development, government adoption, and its proper governance structure. Supporting the federal government is deeply personal to me. I come from a family with five generations of service to our nation. I've always felt a strong commitment to ensuring the U.S. leads the world in adopting next-generation technologies that support our democratic values. SCALE was founded in 2016 with the mission of accelerating the development of AI. SCALE creates training data, fine-tunes, red teams, tests and evaluates the leading frontier large language models and computer vision system. This puts us in a unique vantage point to best understand the development of safe, secure, and trustworthy AI for the public and private sectors. While AI is more accessible today, this does not mean the technology is new. Despite years of global investment in the development of these technologies in the US, China has a clear lead in certain areas of AI technology, such as computer vision for facial recognition. This is concerning because China is using the technology to suppress the Uyghurs and surveil its population. The US is ahead when it comes to large language models and generative AI, though this leadership is at risk. Since 2020, China has launched 79 large language models, launched tens of national AI labs, and has been heavily investing in both the compute necessary to power AI and the engineering talent to develop it. Additionally, this year alone, the Chinese government's investment into AI is at $14.75 billion, which stands in stark contrast to the administration's FY24 proposal for $5.5 billion in federal AI spending. It is critical that the AI is developed and trained in alignment with democratic values. Currently, the best LLMs are developed by some of the leading US-based engineers, and the data they are trained on reflects our democratic ideals. If the US does not continue to invest in developing generative AI, we risk letting the ideals of the Chinese government drive AI development around the world. It is imperative that the United States maintains this momentum if we want the most transformative technology of this era to reflect our leadership. The US has always led the world in adoption of new technologies, and AI will be no different. But when it comes to governance, it is better to be right than to be first. To do this, we must work uh, and lead the development of AI through governance frameworks that enable innovation while putting in place the proper guardrails. Globally, there's no shortage of proposals being generated and passed and all boil down to a key question. How do we know that AI is safe to deploy? Scale firmly believes that the best way to ensure AI safety is through active and constant data fine-tuning, through reinforcement learning with human feedback, 
red teaming to expose vulnerabilities, and then applying a risk-based approach to test and evaluate to ensure that the AI is safe to deploy. These evaluation methods can incorporate ideals that are critical to protect, like property rights over copyrighted materials and other intellectual property. For these reasons, the administration has recognized the value of red teaming and test and evaluation, both in the voluntary commitments that more than a dozen leading companies, including Scale, have agreed to, and through their support for the DEF CON 31 AI Village Red Team event. Beyond putting in place the right mechanisms to ensure the development of safe and responsible AI, Congress must play a role to help enact the right governance structure. In the United States, we've also seen actions that are helping to establish the right foundation. The 2019 AI executive order was a key step to help get our federal agencies ready to adopt AI. More recently, the release of the NIST AI Risk Management Framework, a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, and the Biden-Harris Voluntary Commitments are essential precursors to any comprehensive legislative package. Like other emerging technologies, it's also important to first understand any deficiencies within the current or existing laws. Once these gaps are identified, we can address them through rulemaking and new legislation. While it might feel urgent to act swiftly to keep up with global developments and maintain the United States' strategic advantage, one of the most important things we can do now is to establish an effective regulatory framework that will ultimately be the approach the rest of the world wants to adopt. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Jensen. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, Distinguished Members Subcommittee, uh, I'm going to build off some of their points, and I'll be on time because you have two Army officers in a role, so you're welcome for that. Um, honestly, Go Army, beat Navy. Oh, I, I had to do it to you, sir. Um, no, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of envious when I look at you as legislators. You're sitting at a critical moment in history, and, and, and just separate all the noise for a second and think about the, the task at hand. If you get this right, if we get this right, you set the foundation for economic growth, prosperity, and protecting free markets and open societies for the next generation. So I'm honestly humbled as a citizen to even be part of helping you have that dialogue, and I thank you for continuing to draw attention to it, although now I'm gonna be a bit of a downer and talk about the Chinese Communist Party and economic warfare, because it actually can't. We can't separate you know, your responsibility to us as a nation from someone actively trying to undermine it. So I, I don't think this competition needs to turn to conflict, uh, but it will almost certainly continue to see networks of operatives wage systematic cyber espionage campaigns. Put simply, China is trying to cheat its way into the top of industries in the 21st century. The intellectual property they don't subsidize or buy through shell companies, their cyber spies will steal. It would be foolish to think their quest for dominance in AI would be any different. And let's start with the facts on this. Uh, according to the Dyadic Cyber Incident and Campaign data set, an academic data set that studies uh, cyber statecraft, uh, the Chinese Communist Party and leading the PRC is the world's most egregious actor in terms of cyber espionage, targeting private firms and linked to stealing intellectual property. Since 2000, China has been associated with 90 documented cyber espionage campaigns against rival states. That's 30 percent more than Russia, to put that into context. And I know we all know Moscow is not the good guy there. The actual number is likely higher, and each instance sees multiple businesses targeted and overlapping priority industries that's specified in the Made in China 2025 plan. They're targeted, they're deliberate. The scale of the theft is just staggering. A survey of chief financial officers estimates that one in five U.S. corporations has had their IP stolen. Just think about that for a second. One in five. And I'm sure there's another one that's just not saying. Um, some of the leading generative AI systems, in fact, come out of nonprofit research labs that grew out of tech accelerators and not Fortune 500 companies. And why that's important is if you're a small veteran entrepreneur, I know Representative Klein's done work on that. If you're a small business and you're scraping by to make payroll, are you really buying high end cybersecurity to protect yourself? They have to make hard choices. And frankly, our most innovative companies are the 44% of our economy that's in small businesses that are most at risk from the world's largest thief. I want you to imagine for a second a young startup uh, using generative AI to develop entirely new chemical compounds and materials that could support the green economy. Communist Party linked advanced persistent threat groups could scan the internet for key technologies of interest. I mean, you can openly look up, as you know, patents and where VC money and patents kind of come together is a good indicator. Um, and then they could just go ahead and steal it. 
The case is not far-fetched. In 2014, a U.S. grand jury indicted five agents of the People's Liberation Army for hacking Solar Worlds, a firm that was about to release a revolutionary new solar cell. Every entrepreneur with a new idea for applying generative AI to solve a problem is a target for the largest authoritarian regime the world has ever seen. Even more disconcerting, APT's link to the Communist Party could seek to undermine cloud computing and chip infrastructure the new AI economy will rely on. Imagine an entirely new form of economic warfare in which hackers poison data sets and digitally sabotage data centers in rival state. Again, this is not as far-fetched as it sounds. In 2023, a network of still unidentified hackers, I think we have a good idea who they might be, gained login credentials from major data center operators. The strategic logic of corrupting rival states' data will only grow as the Communist Party um, keep trying to keeps data inside China. Therefore, the question before you is what can Congress do to protect American businesses in this new era of competition? I'll conclude with a few thoughts. First, there is no cybersecurity without cloud security. Generative AI models require access to large data sets and computer power to learn. Helping companies find ways to protect their data without stifling innovation is a critical national security challenge. If we thought of national security in terms of cybersecurity along these lines, the loss of hundreds of billions of dollars in IP theft would be unacceptable. It would be the equivalent of every ship in the Navy sinking each year. Second, we have to probably get to what you heard uh, my colleague talk about to think about how would you go about regulating the gray space used to actually support tech transfers. This isn't just an AI issue. We have American chips and Shahid drones that are hitting Ukraine and hopefully don't hit one of our other major uh, partners and allies. And then third, and this is going to get hard, how do you, without overstepping, actually give grants to small businesses, what CISA does to the .gov, that actually help them secure their own networks so they can focus on being innovative. Um, in closing, competition is inevitable. Conflict is not. And I think that we can make sure we keep this as competition and not conflict if we maintain the strength of our economy through protecting small businesses and the innovation that drives America. And I thank this committee in particular for really taking a lead on that. Thank you. Mr. Sheldon. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. The People's Republic of China presents significant threats to U.S. national interests today. This subcommittee, in the previous hearings in the series has done an admirable job of highlighting the scope and scale of these threats. From the military and diplomatic arenas to all areas of economic and trade relations, the U.S. faces a formidable set of challenges. CrowdStrike, as a leading U.S. cybersecurity company with global visibility, has a useful vantage on Chinese actions in this space. As a technology, threat intelligence, and services provider for the federal government, as well as a commercial provider serving Major tech companies, 15 of the top 20 largest U.S. banks, and thousands of small and medium-sized businesses, we confront all manner of cyber threats. As a brief primer, CrowdStrike tracks threat actors according to three primary motivations, nation state, criminal, or hacktivist interests. When we develop sufficient visibility on these groups to identify or attribute them, we assign them a code name. Under the system, Chinese government-related threat actors are referred to broadly as pandas. Individual groups receive specific names like Judgment Panda or Vanguard Panda, which often derive from community-based identifiers. These groups are numerous and prolific. Out of over 220 named actors, CrowdStrike tracks, at the time of this writing, over 50 are Panda groups. For scale, that exceeds the number of groups we track from Russia and North Korea combined. It's clear that some Panda actors are quite capable. For example, in July, Chinese threat actors once again exploited authentication flaws in the major software company's office productivity and email platform, this time resulting in threat actors' unauthorized access to the email of two cabinet secretaries. Under slightly different geopolitical conditions or adversarial objectives, these incidents could have enabled scaled destructive attacks. The nexus between cybersecurity and artificial intelligence isn't new, but the intersections are increasing and diversifying. For most of the history of the cybersecurity industry, defenses were primarily reactive. An organization would be breached. At some later point, and sometimes much later indeed, malicious artifacts from that breach would be recovered and disseminated among the security community. Vendors would periodically update signatures and their products based on those artifacts, which would limit their impact going forward. When the artifacts changed, even slightly, the process would start again. Starting approximately a decade ago, CrowdStrike pioneered an approach leveraging machine learning and AI to enable more proactive defense. The innovation focused on detecting anomalous behavior in a chain of system events. A tiny software agent deployed to endpoints which stream hashes of system events back to a secure cloud environment. 
AI and machine learning applied against the data in the cloud, as well as AI deployed on the agent itself, would work in concert to detect and prevent threats in real time. Crucially, this approach would work at scale, even for completely novel threats. Today, defenders also leverage AI for vulnerability management, robust identity threat detection and response, and a host of other use cases. For our part, most recently, we've created a capability leveraging large language models, or LLMs, to provide a natural language interface to key cybersecurity tools. This will radically simplify and speed up work analysts do daily and make certain cybersecurity roles more accessible to people with different skills or less formal training. Of course, adversaries will also leverage AI. Threat actors have expressed interest in a number of areas. These include crafting more persuasive lures for phishing attacks, vulnerability discovery, exploit and malware development, bulk data processing, and deep fakes. I've included more detail on these threats and others in my written statement. As the committee continues its work on AI, I'd like to offer a few recommendations. First, support continued AI innovation for fields like cybersecurity. Although threat actors will leverage AI, it's important to recognize the significant current benefits AI is driving in cybersecurity now. Today's solutions overperform by a wide margin legacy tools that do not leverage AI. And importantly, attackers will continue to leverage AI to innovate regardless of the rules of the road for defenders. Second, invest in threat intelligence. The security community must continue to monitor threat actors engaged in intellectual property theft and the use of AI for malicious purposes. The more we understand about these groups, their targeting practices, their resources, and their constraints, the more accurate a threat model we can develop to help us defend against them. And third, promote U.S. federal cybersecurity. The U.S. government faces among the most severe threat environments of any organization globally. To the extent that threat actors are able to leverage AI to enhance their capabilities, the U.S. government will be an early target. Moreover, findings from successfully defending federal agencies can support the development of best practices of value to other sectors like academia, commercial enterprises, and nonprofits. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We now, uh, I want to announce to everyone that shortly after 11 o'clock, we've agreed on a bipartisan basis, we'll take a recess of approximately an hour. So if our witnesses can indulge us by having an early lunch uh, and plan to be back here around noon, uh, our intent is to, uh, to begin coming back and I'll, I'll reconvene. Uh, there may be an intervening vote that we'll have to leave for, but if at all possible, I want to get everyone an opportunity to ask their questions. This is too important to, uh, to not find a way to get it done today. With that, we go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for being here. This is a timely topic and uh, some harrowing scenarios that have been painted here, Mr. Sheldon, Dr. Jensen. I want to ask Dr. Brennan, you stated that China has also started to craft its own AI governance framework that requires adherence to Communist Party principles. Can you describe those principles? Yes, it's very specific, Congressman. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, they have language in the draft regulation like you cannot use artificial intelligence to subvert the government and you cannot use it to promote any principle other than those that the Communist Party agrees to. So it's very oppressive and very counter to the ideals that I think we all hold and it's very transparent. How does a U.S. company collect and prepare data for AI training and how does this compare to how Chinese-backed companies collect and prepare AI data? Thank you for the question, Congressman. First of all, we start with the rule of law and respect for intellectual property. We use contracts to define the relationships between our customers, the large language model builders, and the services that we're providing, which is helping them create exquisite training data sets, whether it's for a large language model or for the self-driving car industry. And the customers are responsible for ensuring that they have a legal right to the data that they're sharing with us uh, for labeling and annotation that we perform that's part of either the training process or the test and evaluation process. And the Chinese com back companies, how, how do they compare? In general, I think uh, from the open source information and from a recent warning by the Five Eyes intelligence leaders yesterday, China is engaged in a broad, organized uh, espionage effort against intellectual property around the world. Uh, they take that data and information and give it either to their ministries, uh, defense organizations, or to the state-owned companies that are acting on their behalf. Are U.S. companies taking appropriate steps to protect their IP and data collection, and if so, can you describe how they're doing so? 
I think this is improving. As a victim of the OPM hack that uh, took all of our security clearance database uh, several years ago, we're all keenly aware of the risk that cyber actors play. It's important that agencies like CISA and the Department of Homeland Security continue to have the education and awareness programs that they have to teach small businesses, universities, and schools how to have proper cyber hygiene. A good colleague of mine even um, recently had, was a victim of ransomware in, in a family business. So uh, it's happening all the time. It's a persistent threat, and we need to think about it like changing the batteries in our smoke detector. It always has to happen. Uh, you've spoken today about how China acquires foreign high-tech, including investments or acquisitions of companies and PRC-backed venture capital funds. Uh, the Congressional Research Service recently addressed this topic in an article related to light detection and ranging technology, also known as LIDAR. The LIDAR market is developing, advancing quickly, and PRC firms are advancing in this area through access to the U.S. market and technology. Would it be fair to say that LIDAR integration is a risk for both computer vision systems as well as generative AI? As you know, the United States regulated the remote sensing industry for a number of years and has loosened that. And we've all benefited from global positioning, satellite capabilities to drive around. Self-driving cars and other industries use full motion video, LIDAR, and other technologies uh, to create the computer vision models that they need to perform well. Uh, I could imagine if I put on my former hat that information like that would be an attractive target to the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. So like all of the other data that's used in the self-driving car industry, it's a high bar for safety, and those companies are keenly aware of the security that they need to apply and leverage some of the leading uh, security capabilities as you, you'll hear about today, I would imagine. So LiDAR data could be used to train AI or make real-time decisions with generative AI based on the training data it's been given? So the, the generative transformers that Google invented in 2017, we've mainly seen applied to language so far, but it could be applied to other data. It's a large matrix, and I think we'll see more experimentation and other modalities in the coming years. And what concerns do you have that China could use data compiled by LiDAR systems to acquire sensitive information and use this information to conduct military or industrial espionage to gain operational advantages? Uh, in warfare, things like understanding the terrain and weather uh, can be classified as secrets. And so any sensor, LiDAR or otherwise, that helps you understand the general uh, condition or terrain is an important asset, and we would need to protect it in the United States. Uh, thank you. Yield back. Thank you. We now go to Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for holding this very important hearing. I also serve on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, as do a couple of other members of this subcommittee, and we're exploring this very issue. Um, I understand the potential of AI to launch our country into a new era of innovation. For example, I've heard from healthcare organizations in my district, I represent the Research Triangle area of North Carolina, um, about way, ways that AI has revolutionized their processes, from analyzing large swaths of medical data to informing research to help doctors more quickly log patient data. I also recently read an article about how AI has helped um, with breast cancer detection and been more accurate even than human detection. Our country has been on the cutting edge of science and technology for decades. And I know that in order to maintain that position, especially when facing competition with China and other superpowers, we need to harness the power of AI. That said, we should not sacrifice individual privacy and intellectual property protections purely for the sake of outcompeting China. Just because China is willing to forego the rights of individuals and creators in the name of competition does not mean that we should lower our standards and risk driving innovators away from our country. Dr. Brennan. Access to vast amounts of unique data is critical to achieving high-performance AI models. Can you describe how disparate policies around data collection and access play a role in our competition with China? 
Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I think what's important for us to preserve, as you outline, is the checks and balances we have in the public sector on government activities, whether it's the institutional review board process for uh, experimentation with human subjects or the sort of uh, classification methods that we use for our intelligence data. Each of those rules was set up in a time and place to protect not only the civil liberties that are related to them and the rights, but also the, the public service or the public good that's trying to be articulated. And I think just as our government dealt with the digitization of information from paper and memos to the internet and email, we have cybersecurity professionals and policies that can help us properly uh, protect the information. Now there is, uh, I think, a still a, a need for the government to feel more open to experiment. Too frequently we meet with customers and they have this fear that somehow if they bring data together, it will have a different level of classification or something like that, and it just slows down the ability to even experiment. We've seen this time and time again in my own career, and so the government should also continue to encourage proper experimentation with good risk management approaches, such as what NIST has outlined, so we can keep innovating and get the benefits that you identified, uh, such as for medical and healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. And Dr. Jensen, um, building on your testimony, as Congress considers proposals for AI regulation, including new agencies dedicated to AI licenses, transparency requirements, and compensation for IP holders, and much more, what do you believe is the best way to pa balance responsible regulation with maintaining our competitive edge? Well, well, thank you for your question and your dedication to this on both committees. I would just highlight for you before I answer that, uh, actually healthcare and public health were the second most targeted thing for Chinese IP theft. Um, so I tend to take maybe a bit more of a free market approach to this, uh, meaning that we have good checks and balances and classifications and we can actually submit licenses. But what you're hearing my colleagues say about doing the right thing and creating overly cumbersome processes really has to be at the forefront of your mind. And the mantra we, we use in my own work on this are standards or strategy. If you set the right standards and the right framework and you let market mechanisms respond to those standards, it becomes a public good that allows for the greater exchange of ideas. And ultimately, as we're seeing, we can't keep having a technological revolution if we over-regulate or curb it before it gets started. So I think the really hard task for you all is what is that balance? What does it look like? What is that licensing framework? If I, as, a, as an entrepreneur, have to spend more money on lawyers to basically submit it and protect myself than I do to hire research scientists, I probably have the wrong balance. I think one very simple first step is, is there some mechanism to help small entrepreneurs get tax credits or incentives to actually protect their own IP? It's their baby. They want to protect it, so help them protect it so we can keep moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. I thank you, Chairman uh, and Ranking Member. Thank all of our testifiers today. Um, it gives all of us great pause uh, over uh, where we are going, where the globe is going on AI, uh, its regulation. Um, I guess I'll start with you, Dr. Brennan. Uh, you talked about uh, that China has a lead on facial recognition. Um, and um, a little bit of a lag on language. Yeah. Talk about how they are using the facial recognition. Uh, you talked about the Uyghurs. Uh, and what can be done in, in terms of governance? What can be done uh, to interrupt uh, the maluse of facial recognition? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. It's fairly pervasive uh, down to the primary school level where facial recognition is used in classrooms to monitor and track every moment of a, a student's day. It extends into the public spaces when uh, people are walking around the streets. There's constant uh, monitoring and then facial recognition. Obviously, that's not uh, the kind of world that we would wanna live in, although computer vision can help uh, with accident avoidance and also in disaster response. So I think the key is to continue to go back to the principles that we rely upon in the Bill of Rights and the protections that uh, the, the House and, and Senate have afforded us all as citizens as we find ways to experiment with computer vision and other uses in our lives. Um, and I think that's the situation uh, we are in compared to China. 
And you talked about in your testimony and in your written testimony about uh, governance, uh, coming up with a framework of governance not being first necessarily but being right. Can you, for a layman, explain what that governance uh, best looks like? Absolutely. I think some good examples are if you turn to the Department of Defense, 10 years ago, the leaders in the Department of Defense wrote their first uh, regulation and rule on how to think about autonomy in weapon systems, and they continue to update it. Part of that regulation mandates that there must be senior level reviewers in the process. And so that's a good example of rulemaking that those leaders can rely upon across the department to ensure that they're going through test safety and other evaluation uh, techniques as they consider an application of AI in autonomy. And if you work your way down through the executive branch, we've had a series of executive orders. We've had uh, a draft AI Bill of Rights from the administration recently. We've had voluntary commitments from large companies, and most of it centers around ensuring that humans are in the loop and that there's a rigorous test and evaluation process. And so if you have at least those three legs of the stool here in the beginning, I think we're gonna be off to a good start in any of the experimentation and agency or departments engaged in. Thank you, it's very helpful. Uh, Dr. Hanas, um, the final thing that you mentioned in your testimony was uh, develop a separate science, I, I missed your, your uh, working name, uh, for the Science Center. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? National Science and Technology Analysis Center, I, I agree, that's not going to make it. Oh, uh, around here, big long names like that work. <laughs> they don't work for me, but. <laughs> this, this has been proposed, this has been proposed more than once. And um, no, one, no one ever objects to it. Uh, that is outside of the intelligence community. Uh, people think it's a good idea. Uh, the arguments are, are, are pretty straightforward and pretty compelling. Um, you know, if you want to understand what's happening globally in science and technology, your, your, first, uh, your, your best source is open source by far. Uh, what, 95, 98% of what's, what's available, you know, you can get through unclassified information. You know, I, I have seen reports written by uh, the intelligence community that are based almost 100% on open source, and they add a classified snippet here and there, you know, to justify their justify their, their budgets and whatnot. But the truth is, for S and T, you know, it, it's all an open source by by and large, and we're not prosecuting it. We're not looking at it. Uh, I mentioned the number. I'm not exaggerating. This is right out of the horse's mouth. 100,000 people or more that are dedicated professionally in China to pursuing this one discipline. Um, frankly, I, I could count on, there were times just one hand, the fingers of one hand, how many people in our community were looking seriously at Chinese S&T. So it's a, there's a big disparity. The problem with the intelligence community is that, you know, they will, they understand the issue, they, they acknowledge it, uh, pay lip service to the fact that it needs to be done, but at the end of the day, they're focused more on current intel. They always have been. S&T is by and large long-term. So uh, that, that's one problem. The other problem is even those within the community that recognize the value of open source itself uh, tend to regard it more as an enabler of the intelligence, the ints that they are, that they are budgeted to support. Uh, using open source, for example, to support human targeting or sig or SIGINT, queuing and tipping, that kind of thing. And they rarely go beyond that. I, I thank you for your answers. Uh, thank you, Professor Sheldon, also for your recommendations and uh, Dr. Jensen, especially for your optimism. You're right. We are here at an important time. I think this committee knows that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to commend you again on uh, these hearings. I, I, I appreciate uh, the way you've uh, structured them and the fact that you've uh, focused on this repeatedly because it's such an important topic and, uh, at least from my perspective, taking a bipartisan approach in doing so. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I did have a question. I think this is for Dr. Jensen. You mentioned um, uh, the, the, I think it was 44 percent of small businesses are most at risk uh, in the United States for these sorts of cyber attacks. Um, and I think there was a suggestion about perhaps we could provide some sort of subsidy or some incentives to help these companies protect themselves. Having come out of a small business, it was a law firm, 
that was uh, victimized in this way and we had to pay ransomware. Uh, you know, I, and I, I'm sure there's, you know, probably millions of companies uh, who need this kind of assistance but can't afford it, or just on the day-to-day -day calculation, you're doing your risk analysis, you know, you just try and keep your head low and do your work, but it's gonna be a problem. So what sorts of things could we as Congress do to help uh, provide, whether it's incentives or subsidies or something, to help these small businesses protect themselves? Well, thank you, Congressman, for that question, and sorry about the Orioles. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, oh, I'm a Nats fan, so I'm, oh. uh, you know, beyond sorrow, I think. Uh, <laughs> total grief, I think, is where we are. But. Total, oh, yeah. Uh, apparently, that's not a bipartisan shared belief <laughs> here. This, uh, the sympathy AI, is limited. Yeah, generative AI is not going to make better baseball players, so we're going to be hurting for a while. Um, I, this is a critical question for someone who grew up raised by also a family that thinks about it. Had, my parents owned a small business, and so exactly what you're talking about I watch daily. I mean, I know it sounds like kitchen table issues, but it was like, are we hiring someone or are we firing someone? So the idea of imagining my mom and dad having to think about spending money on cybersecurity just blows my mind when I think about it. And I think the path ahead for you in Congress is you actually have a great case study in the evolution of CISA. So I think if you actually go back and look at all the fits and false starts really from 2000 forward, as we formed DHS, you began to pull in different agencies and, and kind of really lay that out, I think that'll give an interesting roadmap. Because even though CIS has taken the lead in defending the .gov, that's over 100 different agencies, each that are very different with all sorts of diverse concerns. So I think that actually is a great case study to start with and see what worked, what didn't. The good news is, not to be a shameless self-plug, we're actually launching a big report on that history Monday at CSIS. So we actually detail that history and talk about how do you actually balance that right. But at a minimum, I would think there has to be some type of funding provision. So for example, CISA will fund for those federal agencies, they get the first two years of continuous diagnostic and monitoring software paid for. After that initial two years, the funding becomes a bit more complicated, but at least you can give that jump start in. So it would be a question of how you fund it, what's the right tool, and then we can't pay for everything indefinitely, so is there like a sunset period, is there a cost sharing provision, but I think you actually have a good news story in how CIS has evolved and how you then could apply that to protect those small businesses, sir. All right, and would that be, just to follow up on that a little bit, I mean, sort of a funding source, and I would assume we would, we would knock out, for example, law firms that are doing litigation. I don't, I don't know that we'd have to protect those, uh, you know. Uh, but those that have certain, qualify perhaps for national security providers of some kind or, uh, you know, what sort of parameters could we set so we could target whatever the funding is uh, and, and get the most bang for the buck? So I think there's a number of different ways you could go about doing this. Uh, one would be look at, you know, I'm not saying we go full Communist Party, but what is our national list of critical technologies? And make the fact if you're in some way, shape, or form involved directly or indirectly with that list, you qualify. The other is to just closely look at universities. So I think the same logic actually applies to universities. You know, the top 58 universities uh, between 2002 and 2010 accounted for 37% of patents granted. Right? So you're going to have to help both small businesses who are going to do kind of like fast follower. You know, they didn't build BARD or LAMA or LAMA 2, but they're going to be really creative in how they implement it. But you're also going to have to go upstream and look at those university ecosystems because their budgets are getting hit every year. We're pulling money back at the state level. Private institutions are even seeing lower enrollment. So I think there's going to have to be the funding source will vary by the type of innovation and then even by the type of institution. So it would be both small businesses um, and universities. I do think larger businesses, even though they're important, can, they, they can make those harder choices. But those are the two I'd be most concerned about, sir. And if, I, I'm over time, but if I could ask just one last question. With respect to the larger companies who maybe aren't putting the money towards this that we would hope that they would, would you propose a certain set of standards that would guide them on that front, or should we just you know, be requiring it at some level? What, how would we, how should we approach them? Great question again, Congressman. I, th I think honestly that's already been set in motion with some of the requirements to report cyber incidents. And the question is less about how do you do it is harmonizing who they report to. 
So if you're a major company and you're publicly traded, are you reporting to the SEC first about this, or are you reporting absolutely up how it should be through CISA to actually make sure there's visibility on, on that compromise? So I think you've actually done a good job across parties on getting that right. It's just gonna be harmonizing, because the last thing you want, even if you're a large business, is you get three phone calls, one from the FBI, one from the SEC, and then one from NSA, and then you're wondering, like, which one do I return to first? So I think those are in place for the larger companies. I think it's just a question of harmonizing that they know routinely which call they take first. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you to all the witnesses, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. You're most welcome, and uh, the indulgence came from the ranking member who will now recognize Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jensen, um, China has used AI-generated images to sow discord related to the Maui wildfires a couple of months ago that took a, a, a hundred American lives. What is America's exposure to deep fakes and AI-generated images uh, from China? How, how can that hurt us uh, from a security standpoint? I think deep fakes are gonna be the defining security issue of the next 10 years. As awful as the wars that we find our partners in across, I mean, globally, unfortunately, um, this is the one that scares me the most. Because what happens if you destroy trust in a society? You can't have a open polis and a, and a republic if there isn't the ability to trust the information. And unfortunately, the technology is moving at a pace right now where it's very difficult to keep up with how you can help both, whether through just convention and practice, people identify the fakes, or do clever things like watermarking images. Um, you still probably won't be able to do it with text, unfortunately. So I think that you're, you're, you're grappling with the core issue. And I would say that we've seen this too in some of the tabletop exercises we've been running. So as part of that study on CISA, we got together 60 federal and private sector CISOs, so from large uh, federal agencies and large companies. And we then had 1,000 uh, Americans, a representative sample of 1,000 different Americans play the same game. Both populations were more concerned about deep fakes than I originally anticipated. So I think both the general public is afraid um, and anticipated some of what we saw. We did these before the Chinese actually um, amplified the issues in Maui. And, and business leaders are. The question is, what do you do about it? I think it's gonna have to involve a mix of both technological watermarking, so some requirement to mark images, and it probably is gonna have to come up with something like the Motion Picture Association of America. Like, how do we start to have some independent body that certifies well-documented, you know, fake things that are circulating. I don't know what that looks like, um, but I don't think it should be government necessarily because that will quickly become polarized. But if you have some entity that can just allow people to know, hey, I think most people are actually good at heart. I take a Locke view, not a Hobbes view. So if you let them know they're inadvertently circulating fake stuff, I think a good number of them might back down. But they don't want to be kind of told by a stranger they're circulating fake things. So I think that's where you're gonna have to get after it. I don't think we're ever gonna stop China from doing it though. So it's just a question of rapidly identifying, triaging, and make sure people understand it's fake. Thank you, Dr. Hanas. What role do you think government should play in uh, making sure that deep fakes and AI generated images uh, do not do us harm either national security or economically? Probably not the best person to answer that question, Congressman. I would, um, my concern is not so much with deep fakes per se, but with the technology that supports deep fakes, and that is AI moving on to artificial general intelligence, which offer, which opens up um, a whole, whole lot of other um, well, scenarios which we need to pay attention to, what, deep fakes what, being just one. What, what I'm, I'm more concerned with, with control at discrete control at the neural level, you know, which could actually happen. Okay, well, let me ask that same question of Dr. Brennan. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I think we've already started to see companies highlight this potential risk, and indeed, Alphabet has got a new rule that says if you're going to do a political advertisement and you're going to use generative AI, you need to disclose that uh, to the viewers. So there'll be a combination of things that happen in the marketplace because people want customers and they don't want to harm their customers. Um, but it will be important for the intelligence services and law enforcement to carefully monitor foreign groups 
that are perpetrating these activities and pursue them through all means necessary. And we should expect that there will be more of this. China saw what Russia and Iran attempted uh, in previous elections, and we should just expect it all the time now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sheldon. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with the other panelists that this is a problem that uh, like it could get worse before it gets better. I'm encouraged to see some experimentation, um, both with the people who are producing generative images, like the, the utilities that have created to, to do that, and with how some of the social media networks are promoting the ability for users to tag um, materials that are shared that may be generated. I think we need to have some more experimentation like that, uh, as well as potentially uh, some tools that that operate as registers where people can identify content that they've made and associate it with a date, time, creation, and intention so that people can look at that sort of thing after the fact. They see something that looks suspicious and verify whether it exists um, on such a register. So those are some of the ideas the community is playing with now. And uh, if I might, Mr. Chairman, just one Go final ahead, question. Uh, Dr. Hanas, uh, earlier this summer, the Cyber Security, uh, excuse me, the Cyberspace Administration of China released guidelines for the adoption of generative AI technology, which included new requirements for how algorithms are built and deployed, as well as for what information AI developers must disclose to the government and the public. What is the uh, significance of those regulations? I, th I think they're, they're trying to do two things. Uh, you know, part of it's for show. They want to get out in front and demonstrate you know, that they are, um, that the Chinese government is aware of the problems with, um, with, with AI and, and, and controlling it, on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, I do believe that they are sincere, the Chinese government is aware of its citizens' concerns with privacy um, and are trying to address it because they recognize this as a, a, a popular issue and it's to their advantage to um, to um, address these issues to keep the public happy is what it comes down to. So you know, part of it's it's two sided. Like I said, on, on the one hand, you know, it, it's they're demonstrating to the world that they care. On the other hand, they're demonstrating to their own population that uh, yeah, we 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 hear your grievance and we're doing something about it. Thank you. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize myself for a round of questioning, uh, Dr. Hannes. The uh, this committee uh, enjoys uh, a number of pieces of jurisdiction, and not every question being asked today is within our jurisdiction. But one that is clearly within our jurisdiction is whether we grant any intellectual property protection for copyrights, patents, or even trademarks if they're produced uh, using a regenerative AI or not produced by a human being uh, in a substantial portion. Do you recommend that we adopt a policy of not granting intellectual property protection of that sort, specifically patents, trademarks, uh, and copyrights? And if so, how would we enforce that? I haven't hmm. thought about that problem, no. Um, if I were asked to think about it, as you're, as you're doing now, um, yeah, I, I think we, we need to accept the inevitable that um, generative AI and I don't like to just look at that because you know, we're, we're really dealing with artificial general intelligence at this point. That's just one manifestation of it. You know, it's, it's, it's happening. And um, most of, many of the scenarios, which were science fiction 20 years ago, are being taken seriously now. They're, they're talking about, uh, instead of 30, 40, or 100 years from now, in, in a couple of years from now, you know, we'll be dealing with sentient artificial intelligence. So you know, we, we have to accept that that's going to happen. And, um, deal with it. Uh, should we grant it rights? If it's sentient, we have to. Um, I recognize that that's not going to satisfy a lot of people, but I'm inclined to think that China is right on this score, that we're heading toward a merger of human intellect and artificial intelligence that supersedes both. Dr. Jensen, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a similar question of you uh, and sort of put your military and CIA hat on. Let's presume for a moment that uh, one or more countries uh, intend to collapse our intellectual property advantage, much of which is built on the back of intellectual property protection, particularly patents. 
And let's presume that that country, we'll just call it China for lack of a better uh, name, uh, ran its, its uh, AI system for hours, weeks, months, producing patent claims of things which are not reduced to practice, but reduced to what appears to be reduced to practice, puts a name on it coming out of a lab, but we'll call it Huawei just for a name, and in fact, boxes in with tens of thousands or even millions of claims, obviously costing a lot of money, but boxes in anyone who chooses to actually invent something and then let's particularly assume that they license some and restrict many. Is that a scenario that if you, any of you were running war games, would effectively cripple other countries if you're first to strike? Well, thank you for that question, Chairman. And I volunteer openly before all of you to come run that exact war game on high-end economic competition with your committees, because I'm a big believer in, in the importance of that. And I've already done it with conference at offsite. But I think this is part we'll of take you up on it. Deal done. Um, and, and I testify, so I have to. Um, so this is I would actually take your scenario and take it one step further. I think a lot. I of was our, already bad enough. It, yeah. Well, we're going to make it worse, sir. Um, so, a lot of times we like to think about the history of military confrontation in terms of great men on horseback and decisive battle, but the more insidious side has always been political and economic warfare and how states and loose networks of organizations constrict strategic choice and undermine economic productivity or even fundamental rights. So you've laid out a really compelling move where you use a combination of technology and our own respect for the rule of law to crowd out the space of any one entrepreneur. That even if, even if it, with 10 years later in court, we realize that was just a, a phony patent generated by a bot. Heck, even the lawyer claim process turned out to be a fake AI person filing it online. It's already too late, right? I would compound that further with what really keeps me up is financial market manipulation as well, because there can be no innovation ecosystem if you don't have access to reliable capital. So I would put those two together and start to ask really hard questions about how do we actually create an environment that makes that difficult, and then probably in other Title 50 communities, what is that war in the shadows that denies the adversary the ability to, to make those moves? Which, I've talked about it in the um, written testimony. I think we did that in the early 80s with some of the software sabotage that helped the Soviets think twice about stealing American code. We may get back to that world, um, and I think that's not a bad idea. It's better than open confrontation, but it's going to have to be a multifaceted look at economic and political competition going forward exactly along the lines you lay out, sir. Thank you. I'm going to ask one final question, uh, and this one is, is clearly outside of the jurisdiction of any one committee, but it's, uh, I think, a step that might happen in the foreseeable future. Government has the ability to create regulations or standards. Usually we do those in concert with industry. When we do them best, we do them in, in close concert and, and collaboration with industry. We also have a re the ability in, within that to require fitness or testing. We'll use the, the post-2009 stress testing of banks and so on. We haven't done that in cybersecurity. We've allowed it to, to grow with the idea that the FTC will absolutely cripple you after it happens, unless you're the government, and, and, and all of our clearances are now uh, in the hands of nefarious people. Should we do it? And if, if so, would a combination of, if you will, a U.S. or even a U.S. and ally global umbrella of basic security layer that is there and obviously this would be primarily implemented at the cloud level of each of the major cloud participants, many of whom have already on their own initiative done some of this. And then within the cloud community, currently we do not require, uh, essentially we'll use Oracle or Microsoft or uh, uh, Amazon, any of them, we don't require them to look into the databases of their clients for fitness. And yet, 
because they're in the cloud and because that technology certainly could be implemented, these companies could have a basic standard of fitness that they would be able to do. The question is, should this be something that Congress looks specifically at and works in concert, Energy and Commerce and other committees, works in concert so that we develop those two tools, the umbrella of protection and the system of fitness? So the good news is, after I answer this, I actually know someone who might be sitting at this table who is an expert on the cloud. Um, so I'll defer to the cloud part. But I think the stress testing, the key would be to do this before something like the 2008 financial crisis. And that's going to be a hard sell. Um, but it's something we thought a lot about in the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So I served as the senior research director on that. And one of the things that kind of lingered over a lot of those recommendations was always this idea of how do you actually work across multiple jurisdictions, even within um, our own um, elected institutions, but then also with your partners. And I think some of those are starting to bear fruit. So the first step was you had to put the ONCD in place to try to, as like uh, Ingla said, be the quarterback. I think that's still playing itself out, but working across to kind of do that. The second level that they're just starting is really this idea of um, maybe not security cooperation, but cyberspace security cooperation, and not obviously the Cyber National Mission Force, but teams from DHS and FBI who work with partners. And in all of this, whether it's stress testing um, or red teaming, the key is, which is actually how Threat Hunt really got started, is to let smart people try to break your system so that you can learn from it. So whatever the form it takes, if you can just hold on to that and make people play in a way they're open. The benefit of this is the stress testing because you mandate it, banks have to play, they probably pull their punches once in a while, but you know it, it's built up over time, you can monitor it. Uh, you would have to do something similar. The hard question on the stress test would be how many players? Uh, what's the, um, there's a massive cyber exercise that takes place every two years, that cyber storm that's run uh, there. You need something like that or even just to augment some of the requirements of cyber storm to get after it. But I think the stress test is a phenomenal idea and I, I defer on the fitness of the data in the cloud, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the question. If you remember back to your days in the Army, we had a lot of readiness exercises we would do to be ready you know, and prepared for these sorts of days when they eventually come. Um, I think the cloud service providers uh, have inherent incentives to make sure that their customers are protected. Um, they have programs to constantly remind them of times and ways in which they maybe are not using all the security features of the cloud. And after spending more than seven years working with governments to implement cloud computing technology, I think the leading uh, CIOs and CISOs, even in the federal government, believe that they're safer in the cloud. Now that said, if nation states are going to attack us constantly and attack private citizens and private infrastructure, then I think we should also expect our government to protect us. Okay, and with that, because we do have conferences of both Republicans and Democrats going, and because there's an unknown question of the vote, I'm going to uh, recess until a time certain, which will be 1230, unless we are voting on the floor, in which case, extend your lunch. So with that, we stand in recess.
as we go to a more informal part, do, do any of you want coffee? We were just trying out your chow hall, sir, so I think I'm good. Okay, because we've got, we've got it in the back. Good thing. Okay. The committee will come to order. We'll now go into the, we don't know if anyone else is going to come back, but what you have to say is, is too important for us not to make the record complete. And so in, in spite of the fact that we neither have a speaker, <laughs> uh, nor do, are we well organized and with adult leaders, this committee will attempt to do that. So I'm going to follow up with a, a couple of questions, but if there are things you want to get out that come up uh, from previous questions and so on, we're going, to, we're going to deal with this like an open forum to a great extent, and if other members come in, we'll recognize them as they come in. Uh, I want to ask you uh, a broad question, and that is, if China goes unchecked on its current trajectory, what do you believe will be the result to American enterprise? And then the flip side of it is, if we are to act with legislation, regulations, and procedures, what are the most important among them uh, other than money? <laughs> Which is usually the answer that we get first. So uh, we'll go in. Starting with Mr. Sheldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll uh, constrain my answer to just a couple of topics that already came up this morning. Uh, first, I wanted to talk about um, promoting better defenses for people in small business. I think that was a really productive exchange. Just wanted to add a couple points. One is that it is the case that sometimes cybersecurity technologies just operate better at scale. And in addition to being costly, it just helps to be able to build a big mature security program that can operate 24 by 7 by 365. So one thing that we encourage for policymakers to do is think about how to make accessible things like managed security services, which can kind of bring down that level of maturity that you only usually find in large companies down to very small companies. So um, that's the thing that I would encourage for us. And I think it's worth exploring how we can use tax incentives or other tax mechanisms to be able to promote the adoption of those types of technologies in small businesses. And then the second thing, you asked a great question earlier this morning from my point of view on um, stress testing and thinking about how to get platforms to be able to govern the sort of um, uh, areas of risk under their control. And I think that over the past 15 years, there's been an interesting change in terms of how we've thought about trying to do that. If you go back a long time ago, there was some discussion around using internet service providers as the sort of enforcement point to try and protect uh, protect individual companies or individuals. And then more recently, we've seen some interest in getting cloud service providers to do the same sort of thing. Of course, in both those cases, there's a countervailing interest in protecting individuals' privacy and company interests as well. And that's why the system that we have now is largely predicated on people trying to defend themselves. There's a thing that's happening um, within the US government right now, and it's being driven by CISA, which I think is a really interesting and important way to square the circle. And that is to try and get more concepts like secure by design and secure by default adopted by major platform providers. And the idea behind that is to ensure that you have uh, a situation where companies are accountable for delivering secure services to uh, different users and that so that vulnerable users aren't the ones bearing the responsibility solely for their own defense. And I think that that's a really important concept that we can help promote over time. Thanks. Uh, I'm excited to answer this question. Actually, at lunch, we were talking about how he wished he could have answered the small business one, sir, so that was great. Um, I want to start with the first one about unchecked. Uh, I wonder what will break first, the Chinese Communist Party or the American economy? Um, I am not an optimist for China's future at all. Um, when you have a nation of 1.4 billion that suppresses basic human freedoms and women's right to even have a productive dialogue in their society, um, that shows you things aren't going well. But usually authoritarian regimes are their most dangerous when they're at their death's door. And that means that they will use the competition with the United States as a way to possibly 
rally around the party, right, to basically come at us at every means possible. And I think you've laid out a number of those scenarios, both very creative ways of tying us up legally, accelerating economic warfare, accelerating political warfare, getting us stuck in arms races that are important, but ultimately self-defeating from a net assessment standpoint. Um, now, how do we compete in that, and what can Congress in particular do to, to compete in that? Because I do think, you know, our, our, service, our service members are, are ready for that challenge and been planning for some time. I think it gets back to what we're talking about. How do you promote innovative new companies without over-regulating them? And I 100% agree, this is not a money question. This is a smart governance question and creating that kind of playing field. So whether it's uh, whatever the mechanism, credits, subsidies, there's better experts on that to figure out the right calibration for small businesses and universities so that you make it harder for the Chinese Communist Party to get in. You alter the cost-benefit calculation. Um, I think tech standards are more than just secure by design. We need to start sending our top diplomats to the International Technical Union to negotiate new standards in as technology comes online. I do also think the stress testing, I don't know, I, I don't know if Congress can mandate that, but whatever instrument you could use to kind of push for more than just cyber storm, large scale and games. Just in case you thought it was a made up question, the, uh, the, the concept of how we would do it is to rein in the Federal Trade Commission by mm. creating a safe harbor. Almost every company of any size, their greatest fear is somebody will hack in, some employee will misuse their own authority and then they will be under a consent decree for years and a very expensive oversight, even happens to very small companies, sometimes putting them out of business. So one of the questions we've had in the past, uh, and again, not completely within our jurisdiction, was the Federal Trade Commission has a great ability, except if you're in government, mm. to beat the living hell out of you after you've already been hurt yeah. by some sort of an event. But they, they do nothing or virtually nothing to tell you what to do to prevent it. They tell you, well, use best standards, you know, and it's like, well, if it fails, by definition, they're going to say you didn't meet whatever the, the uh, best standards were. Safe haven of, a, of, quote, recognized stress test and, if you will, cloud, uh, you know, compliant would seem to be that where the government can say, if you do this, we will give you, any, uh, a, even if something bad happens, and eventually it will, uh, because nothing's perfect, we give, we give you the safe haven. Safe haven from litigation, safe haven from your own government. Doesn't mean you don't have to fix, doesn't mean you don't have to make people whole, but that was where we saw the soft hand. Yeah. Uh, the late Colin Powell always said that the way he, uh, he got problem solved, including in Haiti, was he went down there and explained to the dictator that the carrot he was offering is if he left, he wouldn't use the stick. That is sort of what we're saying is we already have a stick. Yeah. Let's find a way to tell people that if they meet standards, we won't use, we won't be allowed to use the stick. So final point to build off that, I think there's something also then too to pooling cyber statistics and having transparent data. So it, we, we for years have had the ability to have near misses reported anonymously to the FAA that lets aviation safer. If we don't start pooling cyber statistics and anonymizing them, we're not going to have a sound set of data to actually be able to price risk. It'd be like trying to run the American economy without accurate inflation data, accurate GDP data, accurate unemployment data. And then the last would be visibility and supply chains. And, and I, I defer to other folks on that, but how do I make sure that what we produce and is patent protected isn't being bought by front companies and given to our competitors? Chairman Isabek, your first question about if China goes unchecked. I think as we look back on the end of the Cold War, uh, there's one storyline that says the American economy bankrupted the USSR. And so you can analogize to a world where China tries to fight a war of economic attrition with all the waste you know, and abuse they can try to get into our system through cyber attacks, theft of you know, intellectual property, et cetera. So that's, a, I think, a very bleak side of the story, and we, we definitely have to keep investing in the institutions and government that protect us from that. On the more positive front, I think our public sector employees need more help. 
There is now advanced persistent threats that they face every day. The volume of information that they're trying to process on behalf of us all is orders of magnitude larger than what we imagined or had to deal with as, as young people. And they don't have AI-ready data. They just have data. So we really need to start working on the more than 700 AI-related initiatives that the agencies and departments have identified already. And they need to start getting experience around it and especially how to apply modern security practices to this AI-ready data that they're going to create and the new applications that they're going to build to deliver better services to us all. In terms of reigning in China, let me speak to what I, I, know, I think I know best. You're not going to stop the informal technology transfer that's happening. It's been going on since the 1800s, by some measure. It's become part of the national psyche. And it's not going to go away, unlike Japan and South Korea and even the United States, which uh, once they became uh, developed nations, technologically proficient, they stopped borrowing from abroad. Right, but you're, you're saying informal, so you're saying more universities who that, publish, publish what they've done and then are shocked that it suddenly disappears into Chinese use. It's a term of art. Ah. Uh, uh, in, informal, extra-legal transfer, the kinds of anything that we don't want to happen is being transferred. Is so you're talking about theft? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, I just want to make sure that, because obviously one of the things that are, we really do, we publish in New England a Journal of Medicine, all kinds of things that are very valuable. They cost a lot, and we do, in fact, create a, a take-it-if-you-want-it environment, but you're talking about over and above that, uh, the, there's, there's always been somebody sneaking in Hire, you know, getting you to hire one of their people for six months to get to know and then run back. We, we identify three major categories of, inform, of technology transfer, legal, illegal, and extra-legal, which splits the difference. Extra-legal is, it, it's, we don't know whether it's legal or not because we're not observing it. We can, but we don't. We're not equipped to do it. Which gets to my point, you know, you won't stop the informal tech transfer, but you can get out in front of it with the right amounts of data. Uh, Chinese um, scientists, administrators, particularly when they're speaking in Chinese, although they know darn well they're being monitored, they don't feel it in their gut. I I'm sure they're listening to me saying this right now and shaking their heads. But, um, you know, that that's the truth. They say the darndest things in their open source materials. And it's all it can all be captured. We've run pilot programs to do that. So, you know, you can understand um, what's going to happen in the areas of technology transfer you know, by, by identifying their needs, first of all. You know, what, 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 do they need, what do they need to acquire that they can't develop on their own? And then also identifying beforehand and monitoring the venues through which they fill these needs, and it's all doable. Um, as far as the AI development effort, you know, ditto, ditto for that. I, I can't say that I can recommend any policies for how to mitigate it. I'd be speculating, but what I can do is, is, is say emphatically that if you want to understand where they're going, you can't do it without data. And we don't have that data at present. We have snippets here and there from which we can extrapolate. We don't have a whole picture. I've got a follow-up question. Um, currently, uh, what they call the BIS controls at Department of Commerce. It's a major undersecretary position. Uh, it controls export. It's your export control, if you will. But it is, it's, it's, it's an export control for hardware, uh, effectively. And when you look at software, things available on the internet, there isn't, in fact, a specific agency, and that agency is not charged with, for example, saying that this technology or time on this computer is, in fact, a national asset. So currently, if I'm sitting in China and I simply rent time on a uh, regenerative, uh, regenerative AI uh, computer, if you will, I can actually take what somebody else has developed, and it's fine, I'm just buying it. And yet, that could allow me to develop some of the most sinister items, even if I didn't have the capability in my home country. And I'm speaking of China, but I'm also speaking of non-state players anywhere in the world who simply have somebody that's willing to give them the dollars. What concern do you think we have and how should we thwart it with, and I'm including non-state actors because I think we've concentrated on China, that's the primary, but I think this is a broader question of 
export controls on our AI capability. We'll go the other direction I'll this time. I'll take a first crack at that. Um, you know, I, I've seen so-called military technology control lists come and go. Um, I don't personally think that there's much to be gained by putting together a list of technologies, hardware or software, you know, that are, quote, at, at risk, because they're almost always obsolete the time that they're published. You, you, on the one hand, on the other hand, you have to do something. You have to identify what you care about, what you don't care about. So where you, you know, you know where to, where, what to emphasize. But the, the bigger issue here, and you, you put your, your finger on it, is this whole notion of you know, basic science. We're not, 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 not stuff that's already patented, not hardware, not machinery, not weapons, but the technologies that are underlying that as they're in the developmental stage. You know, we've for a long time as, as a country have drawn a, a line there. Correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, but my understanding is that we have pretty much let that be open market free reign. It's not something we want to restrict. Uh, now, the um, National Science Foundation, for example, for the first time is starting to take that into account, that maybe we need not to be so open in this area. Uh, that's the U.S. side. I can tell you, uh, again, that China understands this perfectly well, and they identify uh, in, in their open pronouncements the need for them to access technology while it's still in the early stages and while it's still basic science. The one thing they don't really do well is basic science, and for that reason, they're eager, eager to acquire it. If I could add to that, I would say it's, it's important to have this security mindset and overlay exist within each of our agencies and departments, especially as they think about the types of data and types of applications we'll need. Each agency and department is continuing to go through a digital transformation in, in many re respects, and they ultimately are closest to how to properly protect and control this data. I agree with uh, my co-panelists that we want to preserve an open society where People can study what they need to study, learn what they want to, and then create the inventions that we need next. But we should uh, now be mindful of the fact that there is an active, persistent effort to try to steal all of that from us. And so organizations like the Department of Commerce, organizations like CFIUS and others really need to be close to this problem, and we need to rely upon them to come up with the right regulations and rulemaking because they're so close to the right disciplines and domains that they manage. Chairman, I think in two extremes, you've kind of heard it. You either can lock it all down, in which case the cost is you will be less innovative just because there's fewer people exchanging information, or you can completely open it up, right? And then you buy innovation through letting people exchange ideas, but with the clear risk of slippage into other nefarious actors. Obviously, those are extremes, um, and the challenge of legislation is how to find something in the middle. Um, and I think the key to that something in the middle should always be an eye on trusting our ability to out-innovate our adversaries. The fact that they aren't good at basic research should mean we double down in basic research. Um, and then separately, probably find a way, which would be outside of this committee, to lock, to basically go after it through Title 50 means where give them indirect costs for stealing certain things. I just don't think export controls will work in a global supply chain as well as we, they have maybe historically. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa, and thank you all to witnesses for being here. So, so there's this issue I was uh, brief on earlier where countries like China or Germany and so on will say, come to our courts and we'll enforce IP, and then the court will basically set or essentially agree to a worldwide rate for that IP. And so we have a Chinese court educating disputes between a U.S. company and a, let's say, a Scandinavian company. Seems sort of absurd to me uh, that that happens, and I don't know why companies here would have to listen to Chinese courts, but it ends up this is agreement that they have to follow. What do you say to sort of try to solve that problem? I guess... Congressman, I'll listen to a Chinese court when they listen to their own citizens. Um, I, I guess the starting point would be, I think triadic patents are still an important vehicle, because otherwise if we let any one country just recognize the patent, we see what's happened in the past with those ridiculous curves where it's the number of patents granted by any one country. 
Um, so I think finding ways to make sure that you have multiple country recognized versus any one country recognized and then held over the, the U.S. corporation or you at any U.S. entity that's being taken to task. Let me ask you, so are you generally aware of this problem that has started to occur now in countries like China or Germany or, or other places where they say come to our courts and we're going to set this worldwide rate? It's not an area that we've uh, dealt with at scale. I think in general the idea of uh, people shopping for a venue and then trying to get a consent decree that conforms to the policy they're trying to establish is a, is a tactic that we'll see more of. Um, I think it's important that we continue to push in the World Trade Organization and other international venues the protection of intellectual property and national rights. Uh, there is an effort to have a separate world order that China is trying to organize with Russia, the Taliban, the other organizations they've invited to the Belt and Road Initiative recently. That's not a part of the world order that we want to be part of, so we need to continue to push back with our ideals and values. Great. Thank you. Uh, so another question I have is that American businesses are often targeted by China for their intellectual property, either as a cost of doing a business in country or through cyber intrusion. Uh, is China targeting artificial intelligence technologies in this way, and have they been uh, successful? <coughs> if any of you know. I can speak to that. Thank you, Congressman. We have seen interest from Chinese threat actors that, are, that we associate with a nation state in uh, targeting industries like semiconductors, cloud service providers, and even companies that are doing applied R&D or productization of AI technologies uh, for the purposes of intellectual property theft. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, otherwise known as NIST, describes trustworthy AI as incorporating validity and reliability, accountability, and privacy, among other essential building blocks. In its 2019 AI guidelines, the EU included ethics principles for trustworthy AI. Uh, do you believe Congress should incorporate trustworthy AI into its legislative proposals? Uh, what's your view on that? Uh, Congressman, thank you for that question. Uh, we definitely support the administration and the leading companies around the world who are developing these models and embedding ethical and responsible AI principles in what we're doing. The NIST's AI risk management framework is a great articulation of that, and we also see uh, it being implemented through model regulations in organizations like the U.S. Department of Defense. And in order to really achieve ethical, responsible AI, it's important to have humans in the loop at every step and to have test and evaluation methods that rely upon benchmark tests that are often created by academic organizations or federally funded research and development corporations to ensure objectivity. Even if other countries like China, if they were to not adopt any sorts of guardrails or uh, frameworks like what NIST has put out, do you believe the United States and specifically Congress should still do so? Uh, Congressman, I think it's very important for the United States to continue to lead in this regard. In my testimony, I talked about it being more important to get it right than to be first and to create the kind of governance framework that other countries around the world will respect and want to implement. And the alternative is if we do not continue to lead, China will continue to promote the kinds of regulations that they've been drafting, which include language like you cannot use artificial intelligence to subvert the uh, People's Republic of China Communist Party and the other uh, values that the Communist Party upholds. Thank you. And then my final question uh, to Mr. Sheldon. Uh, how has China's acquisition of data through Chinese-based applications, purchases from data brokers, and cyber intrusions assisted the PRC in the development of artificial intelligence? And can you explain this strategy of mass data acquisition? Thank you, Congressman. I think uh, we should have an expectation that China will continue to aggregate large data sets for a variety of different purposes. Um, in some instances, uh, it could be the case that there are future use cases that they haven't even resolved yet, that they want to have data stores on hand. And obviously, the advent of AI makes data that they have been able to aggregate much more valuable. So it seems clear that some of the data stores that they've targeted 
over the last number of years have informed counterintelligence use cases, R&D use cases, and other technological development, and then there could be future ones as well, and we should be alert for that. Thank you. I yield back. Well, the time often comes, even in our hearings, when they have to come to an end. I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony, uh, as is <clears throat> uh, the practice of the committee. We're going to hold open for, uh, for five days for additional questions, if you'll agree to, to take them and respond. Additionally, any additional thoughts, including publications that you think would be helpful, uh, if you submit them, we'll place them in the record. With that, I thank you again, and we stand adjourned.